He's an enigmatic actor, legendary actor. The only one in the history of the existence of the main award of the American Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences who received three Oscars as the best actor. He was knighted for outstanding services to drama and is now called Sir Daniel Day-Lewis. At the same time, you'll not find loud headlines with him and his name is familiar only to moviegoers. In order to better get into the role, he voluntarily put himself in prison, lived in the woods for months, eating only what he could find, confined himself to a wheelchair and learned to use only one leg, imagining that the rest of his body was paralyzed. So who is Daniel Day-Lewis really? What was his childhood like? How did he become the person we all know and respect? What made him make a loud announcement that he was leaving the movies forever at the very peak of his amazingly successful acting career? Stay with us on the Biographer channel and we will dive into the life story of this extraordinary actor with you. Welcome to Earth, my child. Joy bells of blossom swing. Lambs and lovers have their fling. The streets run wild with April airs and rumors of the sun. We time-ward folk renew ourselves at your enchanted spring as though mankind's begun. Again in you, this is your birthday and our Thanksgiving. For someone, parents give a baby carriage or a cradle. For someone, a lot of wonderful toys. In April 1957, the baby Daniel Michael Blake Day-Lewis was given a whole poem by his father in addition to the usual children's stuff. And maybe there would be nothing special in this if that poem had not been written by Cecil Day-Lewis himself, CBE slash commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire. A famous Anglo-Irish poet of such scale that a few years later in 1968, he was elected Poet Laureate. Daniel's mother, Jill, was also a creative person. The beautiful Jill Balkan, who was Polish on her mother's side and had Jewish roots on her father's side. She was an actress. In addition, she was the daughter of Sir Michael Elias Balkan himself, a famous film producer who from 1938 to 1955 headed the most famous film studio in Britain at the time, Ealing Studios, which was also called British Hollywood. It was in his honor that later in 1979, one of the most prestigious film awards, BAFTA, the British Academy of Film and Television Arts, was founded. Perhaps Jill's acting career could have turned out differently, but she focused on her family quite early, becoming the wife of Cecil Day-Lewis and the mother of his children. At the time of her acquaintance with the famous poet, the talented and promising beauty was just beginning her creative career as an actress on the stage of the theater, in the movies, and on TV. In 1948, in the BBC studio, when she voiced a radio program, the young woman met Cecil. He was an imposing, famous, charismatic professor of poetry at Oxford, 21 years older than her, and married. In addition, he was not just married, but had been married for 20 years, had a wife, two children, and a mistress. That dark-haired brunette with a deep, expressive voice for which the listeners of BBC programs loved her so much did not become, for the poet, another victim of the frivolous affair for which he was known. That time, he fell in love for real, divorced his wife, and in 1951, he and Jill officially married. Jill's father, Sir Michael Balkin, was strongly against this marriage, but nothing could come between Cecil and Jill. They were real soulmates both madly in love with poetry and each other. When in September 1953, the couple had a daughter, Tamison, and four years later, on April 29, 1957, a son, Daniel. It did not greatly affect immersion and their own love. The children were entrusted with the care of nannies, while their parents continued to live the usual life of a poet and his muse. That is why Tamison and Daniel became the closest friends, partners in games and partners in crime from the very childhood, and it has remained so to this day. The emotional detachment of the parents brought the brother and sister closer, making them literally one whole in those years. It's not that their parents didn't love them, it's just that the famous dad spent a lot of time in his office at work where children were strictly forbidden to wander, and mom was more concerned with creating a favorable atmosphere for their father. We were mostly left alone, and Papa was older than most of our contemporaries' fathers as we were his second family. He was perhaps more distant than many of his generation because of the nature of being a poet and writer. He was, however, ruthlessly fair, gentle until driven to fever pitch, with a childlike sense of humor and natural grace. When Daniel was two years old, the family moved to Greenwich, to an old house of Crooms Hill Street, most of the buildings on which date from the 17th and 18th centuries. 
They lived in a building of dark brick with white shutters and dark red doors, in the very attic of which, under the same roof, two children spent most of their time. They had a nursery and an attic at their disposal, and there they were completely separated from their parents, who occupied the four lower floors. The children went downstairs only for the official dinner. We didn't come down for dinner, we had tea in the nursery with Nanny and were thrown together into a solitary world but for each other, which led us straight to the landscape of the imagination. There was another dramatic circumstance that distanced the parents from Daniel and Tamison and filled the whole atmosphere of the house with a gloomy sense of inevitability. Cecil's illness. Since the beginning of the 60s, the poet was ill almost all the time and the whole home life of the family revolved around not bothering dad, not only because of his work, but also because of his health. But there were pleasant moments in life in this creative house on Crooms Hill. There was a theater right across the street. Even then, Daniel was fascinated by the special magic associated with acting. We, we lived, I watched from the wind, top window of our house as they rebuilt from the ground up a, a cinema that had been bombed during the war. And they built it into a theater, which is now the Greenwich Theater. And my mother always sort of made it clear to anyone that was working at the theater that the house was open to them if they wanted to just come and relax and mm. spend a bit of time there. And I got to meet some lovely people during that time. But the most vivid childhood memories for the children were trips with their parents to the coast in County Mayo. From Tamison's recollections, they never took a vacation with their parents until she was nine and Daniel was six. It was then that they went to the west coast of Ireland for the first time together as a real family. And from that time, until his father's death, they spent summer vacations together in Ireland, in the country where Cecil Day Lewis was born. These indescribably beautiful and boundless wastelands of the Atlantic coast, the feeling of being at the very edge of the world, unity with parents, made an unforgettable impression on the children. A different way of life that had a profound influence over our lives. In showing us the heritage we came from, our father, without imposing it, allowed it to bed down and settle like sediment, layer after layer, year after year. Especially important in these travels for Daniel was the closeness with Cecil, which he had not felt before. Although he definitely adored and respected him from early childhood, Ireland gave the boy a real dad. Not a great poet laureate, but a father who shared his childhood memories, told about his favorite places, his childhood friends. But in addition to the summer vacation, there was also such a routine necessity as school. Parents sent Daniel to an ordinary school in South London. Since Cecil Day Lewis was actively interested in the ideas of communism in the 1930s, he was very close to the idea of class equality. Therefore, the decision to send the children to an ordinary school, where children from the ordinary strata of society studied, seemed right to him. Daniel, raised by nannies and governesses, a descendant of an artistic family from high society, unexpectedly found himself among the tough kids of South London. These were Sherrington Primary School in Charlton and Invicta Primary School in Blackheath. Daniel was mercilessly bullied in both of them, because there were several reasons for that. His background and the fact that he was considered posh. In my case, they could have chosen any one of a number of insults, since I was Irish and Jewish, and from a different class to most of the kids. They knew that because of my voice. But children are very adaptable. They're great performers. They perform for their parents all the time to find out how to get what they want. To me, it was absolutely unconscious. It was raw survival. So the boy had to play on the live stage for the first time, using his innate acting skills. In order to stand out as little as possible, he mastered the local accent and began to imitate the manner of behavior of local boys, in which he achieved such success that he even became his own among juvenile hooligans. A few years later, in 1968, when the parents noticed disappointing changes in Daniel, the fact that he had become more wild and undisciplined, they decided that democratic education should be put an end to. The boy was sent to Seven Oaks, a boarding school for boys in Kent County, whose strict discipline was supposed to turn Daniel on the right path. He hated the school from the very beginning. The place was alien and unattractive in every single one of its millions of details. A feeling of nausea stayed with me from the moment I got there until the moment I left, and there was the code of honor, so you never talk about your suffering, so you have to do it in silence, or find a place where you can be on your own and scream. But it was this school that revealed two important things for him, which would play a significant role in his later life. One would become a favorite hobby, and the other would be a lifelong calling. Those two things were woodworking, namely cabinet making, and acting. When Daniel was 12 years old, he single-handedly took on a school project, a ping-pong table. And despite the ambitious nature of the project, he succeeded. 
He took this table home and they used it for many years. Later, as an adult, he did not abandon his passion and enjoyed making exquisite furniture and objects, especially for gifts to his relatives and friends. So there was a beautiful round dining table and chairs in his mother's cottage in Hampshire for many years, which he made especially for her. How about the theater? Why did he choose acting, and even in such a strict school as Seven Oaks? At a very early age, at a time when I was really not kind of, I wasn't a good student, uh, to say the least. And, um, and so the idea of the stage, the stage, you see, in, in schools, in schools, especially, I think, boarding schools in England, the places where, where if you don't, uh, if you're somehow an outcast, if you're living on the edge of that very severe community, um, art rooms and theatres are the places where all the kind of, all the spiritual lepers congregate. He made his stage debut as a black boy in the play Cry the Beloved Country. For this role, he wore all black makeup and later happily stained the Snow White school sheets with this paint, which did not completely wash off. In this way, he did at least some damage to the hated school. Being in this place was so terrifying for Daniel that his mother even forbade him and Tamison to correspond while he was there. I had been forbidden to write to him by our mother as my school tales were pure joy and he was suffering pure hell. After two years in the hated Seven Oaks, the parents took pity on the boy and transferred him to the more progressive Bedal School in Petersfield, where Tamison was already studying at that time. Not to say that this happened only because of the parents' own decision. The decision was preceded by Daniel's dramatic escape from school. According to his sister, Daniel, together with two friends, got together and roamed the country, having only pocket money and a pack of cigarettes without filters. But before that, another thing happened to Daniel in the summer during the holidays between the transfer from Seven Oaks to Badal's. Although it seemed to him just an interesting adventure, it would later be interpreted by biographers as the beginning of an actor's career on the big screen. In 1970, when the boy was 13 years old, while playing football with friends in Greenwich Park, Daniel, completely unexpectedly for himself, got his first role in a real movie. The director of the drama Sunday Bloody Sunday, John Schlesinger, was just looking for boys on location who could play in episodes as juvenile hooligans, and then a local seller recommended Daniel and his friends to him. Later, the actor, with a smile, recalled the role as heavenly because for the exciting vandal experience of scratching the shiny sides of parked cars with keys and coins, he was also paid as much as two pounds. Badal's, a liberal and student-oriented school where relationships with teachers were more open, left Daniel with only pleasant memories. There, he continued to play on stage, and it was in Badal's that the only time the father saw his son participate in a play. It was the role of Florizel in the Shakespeare play The Winter's Tale. But even in this school, Daniel did not stop doing bad stuff, although Tamazin was usually the initiator. Though we both did rebel most of the time, drinking, smoking, stealing, organizing a hunger strike, escaping late at night to the opposite sex's dorms, we led by bad example. I egged Dan on, and he has told me since, was an evil influence. He insists I made him steal for me. My defense, it was his choice. We were partners in crime. Besides his sister Tamison, Daniel had two more half-brothers, Cecil's sons from his first marriage, Sean and Nicholas, with whom the children hardly communicated due to the significant age difference. Later, Nicholas went to live in Australia, but with Sean, who became a journalist, the brother and his sister subsequently maintained a relationship for quite a long time. However, in 1994, communication between Daniel and Sean finally broke off, after Sean helped the journalist write his version of Daniel's biography, which contained a lot of incorrect dates and twisted facts. Cecil died in 1972 after a long illness from pancreatic cancer when Daniel was only 15 years old. When dad was dying, Daniel held his hand. Shocked to the core, the teenager returned to school and immersed himself in woodwork to at least somehow escape from the grief that was consuming him. Due to stress, Daniel developed constant migraines, and in 1973, when he was prescribed painkillers because of this, he became addicted to them for a while. One day, he drank too much, and the school management had to lock him in a room under the nurse's supervision so he would come to his senses. But over time, everything got better in the teenager's life. Even then, a bright, dark-haired, handsome athlete with a penetrating look and a seductive smile broke the hearts of many girls. 
He even had the nickname Daniel Day Pinup, which was awarded by his female fans. But despite the wide choice, Daniel at that time remained faithful to his only chosen, Sarah Campbell, with whom they were together for almost a decade until his filming in the unbearable lightness of being in the late 80s. A stable and permanent school life in Badals ended in 1975 and the young man faced the choice of a further life path. And he had a lot to choose from because in the future he saw two options for himself, following his two constant passions, to become an actor or to study furniture making. For about a year he was simply in limbo, not knowing what to choose. I just didn't know what to do. I did laboring jobs, working in the docks, doing psychic reading, construction sites. At first, his choice leaned towards an apprenticeship as a cabinet maker, and he applied for a five-year apprenticeship with one of the most famous masters of this business. That application was rejected due to Daniel's lack of necessary experience. So the young man entered the Bristol Old Vic Theater School. By that time, he had already managed to achieve some success on the stage, in addition to school productions in Badal's, taking part in performances of the National Youth Theater in London. Daniel studied at this institution for three years. One of his teachers, John Hardock, who taught acting, recalling Daniel's student years, noted that even then the young man stood out from other students with his skill. There was something about him even then. He was quiet and polite, but he was clearly focused on his acting. He seemed to have something burning beneath the surface. There was one performance in particular when he really seemed to shine and it became obvious to us, the staff, that we had someone rather special on our hands. Immediately after studying at the theater school, Daniel began to perform on the stage of the Bristol Old Vic Theater, on this same stage where his mother played during one season. At the beginning, he had only secondary roles, as was normal for novice actors. But in 1980, Daniel began to appear on the stage in more significant roles. In 1981, Day-Lewis got the main roles in two productions, Jimmy Porter in the play Look Back in Anger and Count Dracula in the play of the same name. It was at this time that the first roles on television and cinema began to appear. Daniel's screen debut took place in 1980 in an episode of the detective series Shoestring, followed by a small secondary role in the sci-fi drama Artemis 81. The year 1982 brought Daniel his first big movie role, a small role in Richard Attenborough's epic biopic Gandhi. In the same year, the actor got his first main role on TV in the TV movie of the BBC studio How Many Miles to Babylon. Probably it was then that he first fully felt the difference between acting in the cinema and acting in the theater and started to decide which acting was more suitable for him. Theater invites a nuts and bolts process to rehearsing in which all the actors are transparent to each other. For me, I still needed to believe in a kernel of truth, and I find it hard to do in a rehearsal situation where everyone is saying, are you going to do it like that? It's distracting and deadly in the end to any discovery you might make. Furthermore, Daniel stopped enjoying performances at the Old Vic. He was not a fan of the classics, although he was brought up on it and believed that any actor must necessarily go through it. He was more attracted to modern, expressive, and sharp works. In addition, once in 1976, when he was still at the beginning of his acting career, he was incredibly impressed by Robert De Niro's performance in Martin Scorsese's film, how the actor completely transformed into his character. Daniel set himself the goal of mastering such an art. Rumor has it, it was then that Daniel became interested in studying Stanislavski's method, which he later used to play, conquering the audience with the realism the images embodied by him. But his teacher at the Bristol Old Vic, John Hartock, has a slightly different opinion on this as he was able to observe the formation of Daniel's acting talent at its very beginning. The teacher claimed that although Daniel was always and everywhere called a method actor, he would rather call Daniel's acting style authorial, based on the method. But when we talk about method acting, we tend to be specifically talking about the school of acting developed by Lee Strasberg, developing the theories of Stanislavski. What Danny does isn't quite that. He just completely immerses himself in a character, but that comes as a result of the incredible attention for detail he was already demonstrating when he was here in Bristol. In 1982, the long-awaited changes in Daniel's theatrical life finally took place. He was cast in the main role in the play Another Country by the modern playwright Julian Mitchell, which was shown on the stage at the Queen's Theatre in London. It was then that the actor began to be invited to his first interviews for the press and TV because his performance of the role was a great success, although he himself said that at the beginning it was not easy to enter the stage in a role that Rupert Everett brilliantly played before him in the previous theatre season. Daniel managed to find his voice in this performance. 
and to find it, paradoxically, he used memories of his studies in the hated Seven Oaks and its atmosphere. Because the play was precisely about two guys from high society from the same school who were recruited to spy by the Soviet Union. 1983 gave Day-Lewis a role in his first blockbuster, The Bounty, released in 1984. It was a mediocre role of the assistant captain with a minimum of lines and a very successful version of the story of the mutiny on the ship Bounty, where he was lucky enough to act next to Mel Gibson and Sir Anthony Hopkins. The inconspicuousness of the role in The Bounty, the actor more than compensated for his ego by joining the troupe of the most prestigious theater in Britain, the Royal Shakespeare Company. Daniel explained the decision to join the RSC in different interviews in different ways, but the main statement was expressed in the phrase, why not? It was a challenge, an aptitude test, because only the best were chosen there. But there was one significant minus. Daniel Day-Lewis had to play the classics again. The mid-1980s for Day-Lewis can be called the years of his film breakthrough. It was at this time in 1985 that the British drama miniseries of the BBC, My Brother Jonathan, was released. The actor was invited to play the main role of a young idealistic doctor who lives in the shadow of his brother all his life, both in life and in love. Daniel appears in two bright and completely opposite roles the same year. A street punk homosexual in the romantic comedy My Beautiful Laundrette, directed by Stephen Frears, and a refined snob in James Ivory's romantic melodrama A Room with a View. More dissimilar stories cannot be imagined, and it happened that they appeared on the screens almost at the same time. So, before the eyes of both viewers and critics, the magic of virtuosic transformation was shown, which was performed by the aspiring actor Daniel Day Lewis. We can say that he was lucky to some extent because his acting was noted and remembered precisely in this contrast. Even the most famous film critics, including the American Roger Ebert, did not overlook the actor's performance. The character of Johnny may cause you to blink if you've just seen the wonderful A Room with a View. He's played by Daniel Day-Lewis, the same actor who, in Room, plays the heroine's affected fiancé Cecil. Seeing these two performances side by side is an affirmation of the miracle of acting. That one man could play these two opposites is astonishing. In My Beautiful Laundrette, Daniel is passionate and tough. In this story, which unfolds in the 1980s in the area of South London, the main character, a young man of Pakistani origin, fully experiences the snobbery of those times. Racism, colonialism, sexism, and homophobia. The main character is helped by his childhood friend to make his way through life's difficulties. He's a punk extremist and the leader of a street gang who becomes his lover, played by Daniel Day-Lewis. At first, the director offered this role to Daniel's peer, actor Gary Oldman, but he refused, citing the fact that he did not like the script and dialogues. But for Daniel, playing the role of Johnny was very out of hand because of his teenage experience as a young London hooligan. Director Stephen Frears later told the story of how Daniel, whom they had first met when Frears was casting for another one of his films, Prick Up Your Ears, was desperate to get the part and wrote him a nasty letter. In this note, he promised to break both of the director's legs if he did not get the role of Johnny. The actor himself, answering questions about this incident in an interview, recalled with a smile that he certainly had no such thing in mind. He was sure that Stephen would understand him and it was not intimidation, but a desperate attempt to show his enthusiasm and that he really fits the role of a street bully, and it worked. Johnny Embodied by Day-Lewis is rude, narcissistic, shocking with the unexpected tenderness he's capable of. He won over critics with his charisma in this role. The film was unexpectedly a great success, and the box office many times exceeded the budget spent on it. Even then, Daniel was not afraid of bold, socially significant roles. Daniel's hero is a delinquent, an audacious hooligan with dyed hair, who found himself at the epicenter of the ethnic conflict existing in society, which at that time was not accepted by the official authorities to recognize and bring to the public. And Frank Lovescene, to the partner in the film, who played a young Pakistani businessman, openly violated sexual taboos that were not often dared to be neglected even in the more frank American cinema. The picture was nominated for an Oscar and a BAFTA for the Best Screenplay, and Daniel received his first film award as Best Supporting Actor from the U.S. National Board of Review of Motion Pictures. By the way, this year he received two absolutely identical film awards as Best Supporting Actor because he was also awarded the same award from the U.S. National Board of Review of Motion Pictures for his role in A Room with a View, the filming of which he joined immediately after the end of filming My Beautiful Laundrette. A Room with a View is a romantic film adaptation in which Daniel played the proud and arrogant aristocratic Cecil Weiss, the fiancé of the main character, who was played by Helena Bonham Carter, also a newcomer in the world of cinema at that time. 
The woman is torn between the planned wedding with the curmudgeonly Cecil and her love for another man, passionate and free-spirited. Rupert Everett was also auditioned for the role of Cecil, but Ivory decided he wasn't quite right for it. The choice fell on Day-Lewis when the director saw him in one of the main roles in the theater performance Another Country, which brought Daniel theatrical fame in the early 80s. And here, the director hit the bullseye, because the image of an aristocrat from high society, as well as the image of a street hooligan, was also familiar to Daniel since childhood. He grew up in this environment, was a part of it from birth, and therefore Cecil Weiss came out more than convincingly in it. But at the audition for the role, Day-Lewis appeared in the image of a punk Johnny, which quite surprised the director James Ivory. At the same time, Daniel claimed not the role of a romantic hero, but the role of a secondary character, the refined esthet Cecil. And although he incredibly convincingly got used to his character, the actor himself said about his hero the following, He was a man worthy of a great deal of compassion, and whose skin I could occupy in some of my worst nightmares. Cecil is the sort of man who would never play tennis, who wears a pince-nez, who oils his hair, and who thinks girls are nice because they like to listen to him read aloud. Cecil does not have many clues as to what else girls might be nice for. And Daniel Day-Lewis creates a masterpiece in his performance as Cecil. Give him a monocle and a butterfly and he could be on the cover of The New Yorker. The picture was actually a big success. With a budget of $3 million at the exit, the box office brought in about $21 million in profits from worldwide distribution. The film was nominated for eight Oscar categories, of which it won three. Twelve BAFTA nominations, of which it won four, including the Best Film category, two Golden Globes, and a lot of the most prestigious film awards from around the world. At the end of the same year, director Alex Cox, having seen Daniel in the role of Punk Johnny, considered the actor for a role in the biopic Sid and Nancy, based on the life of the scandalous lead singer of the Sex Pistols band. But at the last moment, he gave the role to Gary Oldman. But Daniel Day-Lewis didn't lose by missing out on the role of Sid Vicious. Instead, in 1986, on the stage of London's Royal National Theatre, he played the bright and ambiguous role of the rebellious, odious poet Vladimir Mayakovsky in the play Futurists. His performance as the poet of the Soviet Revolution was epic, and the performance received many positive reviews. Washington Post correspondent Anne Hordenay recalled her impressions of Day-Lewis's play in an interview with Daniel like this. Day-Lewis dominated the play, with a towering, all-consuming performance, his shaved head making a 6-foot-2-inch frame even more imposing, his shock and awe, delivery of Mayakovsky's poetry, an explosive torrent of politics, passion, and commitment. He even seems capable of making the vein on the side of his forehead pulse at will. This was his penultimate role in the theater, which he would later leave forever, making the final choice in favor of playing in the movies. In 1987, the American director and screenwriter Philip Kaufman invited Daniel to play the main role in the film adaptation of the best-selling novel of the same name by the Czech writer Milan Kundera, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. For filming in this movie, Day-Lewis probably used the method of immersion in a role for the first time, which later, describing his biography or acting career, only a lazy person won't mention. Method is a set of techniques that some actors use to make their performance more realistic. But there is one but. In the many interviews he gave over the years of his acting career, Daniel never personally directly referred to the Stanislavski method as something other than what he relied on when getting used to the role of another character. It appealed very much to something in mine, and I never chose to define it or analyze it in any way whatsoever. I couldn't begin to imagine where some of that had come from because it didn't always appear to have a logic, and yet it appeared to me to have its own innate logic. Yes, there is definitely a similarity in approach, despite the fact that at one time the actor studied the method for himself, but Day-Lewis most often describes his system of immersion in the role as his own, very intuitive internal process. He always claimed that in his own approach to work with the role, he was simply trying to find something for himself, someone or several details that could help him enter the universe of his character, feel himself in his skin. And just as often, he emphasized that sometimes he did not even imagine where the idea to approach his acting transformation for each specific role came from. I've no idea what that transaction is all about or from where the need arises, but it's a response, obviously, to a very particular need at a very particular time. A need to express oneself in that way. Already starting with the unbearable lightness of being, Daniel used, not yet so clearly, a technique of preparing for the role which was not typical for most actors. This time, it was learning the Czech language. 
Daniel was supposed to play the Czech neurosurgeon Thomas, and the main events of the picture took place in the Czech Republic in the mid-60s, in the days of the infamous Czech Spring of 1968, when the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia. The plot revolves around Tomas' relationship with his lover, a free-spirited artist, played by Lena Olin, and a young girl, waitress Teresa, played by Juliet Binoche, with whom he unexpectedly falls in love. As Daniel said about his character, Thomas is afraid of falling into the love trap, and in fact, he's rather a bad character because he hypocritically protects himself from the inconveniences that may be associated with love. However, later, after many years and several Oscars, the actor admitted in an interview that the decision to take on this role was not very successful. Despite this, he did not regret it because it was a good lesson and an experience that taught him a lot. Why did he regret it? He admitted that he took up the role in the first place because there was a lot of noise around the picture and it was a great chance for a young novice actor to get into such a project. Daniel admitted that it was worth distancing himself from all this hype around the picture to dive deeper in the script and realize that he's not yet ready for such a role, because at that moment he did not quite grasp the deep essence behind the story. It was in this search for a hero, how to present him, something that he could cling to in order to unwind the tangle of the character's essence and give him realism, that Daniel came up with the idea of the Czech language. It was something to do with the language. The idea of speaking English with a Czech accent without actually speaking Czech means it wasn't coming from anywhere. I knew that kernel of truth that I need to have somewhere in a role would be missing. The Foreign Service Institute, or FSI, rated the difficulty level of the Czech language for English native speakers as 4 out of 5, with 5 being the highest level of difficulty to learn. Day-Lewis studied this complex language during the six months of filming and a little before, just to find a connection with Tomas and present him to the audience more realistically. Already on the set of The Unbearable Lightness of Being, Daniel spent most of the time in character, although as he later joked in one of the interviews, after spending all these six months in the image of Tomas, he still did not run around Paris seducing young maids. The film was shot in Paris, and in its festival version its full running time was three hours long. The picture turned out to be quite controversial due to its specificity and receiving very high ratings from critics, it actually failed at the box office. Full of erotic love stories of three people, against the background of dramatic political events based on a philosophical novel, the product was quite specific. Besides, Kundera, who was invited as the official consultant of the picture, was completely dissatisfied with the final result, but not everyone agreed with the author of the novel. Most critics were delighted. The website Rotten Tomatoes gave the film an 86%, and most reviews almost unanimously characterized the film as an incredibly successful combination of political and erotic, where human sexuality is explored against the background of social upheaval. The film will be noticed primarily for its eroticism. What is remarkable about the unbearable lightness of being, however, is not the sexual content itself, but the way Kaufman has been able to use it as an avenue for a complex story. One of nostalgia, loss, idealism, and romance. And although the box office revenue did not meet expectations, the unbearable lightness of being received two Oscar nominations. The film did not become a hit, but it showed Day-Lewis to the world as an exceptional actor, and the love scenes full of eroticism and emotional tension made Daniel a sex symbol. There were a lot of naked Day-Lewis in the picture, and for the actor himself, the episodes in which the scenes unfold in bed were a certain challenge. He was not prepared for how he would feel. It was also a factor that later made him believe that agreeing to film in the unbearable lightness of being was his mistake. If I had even begun to think of the thousands of people who might see me in those love scenes out there behind the lens of the camera, I wouldn't have walked onto the set. The idea of all those people seeing me nude, but I'm also naked metaphorically. Every time you give a performance, you take your clothes off. Just after filming The Unbearable Lightness of Being, rumors about an affair between Daniel and his partner in the film, French actress Juliette Binoche, began to circulate. But, as is usually the case when it comes to Day-Lewis' personal life, it still remained a mystery and based on hearsay. The truth is that it was during this period that Daniel broke up with his girlfriend, Sarah Campbell, with whom they had been together since their days at Badalas School. Filming the duration of which dragged on for eight months exhausted Daniel because already in this film he tried to be in the role most of the time. Not yet as deep as in his next Oscar-winning roles, but enough to make you want to rest. But instead of rest, he dived into a new project, completely opposite to lightness. The American comedy Stars and Bars, full of black humor and irony, which was released in the same year as The Unbearable Lightness of Being. In the film, Day-Lewis played a British art critic who travels across the United States to the South to appraise a Renoir painting from a private collection. 
In Stars and Bars, Daniel Day-Lewis is chased by an Elvis look-alike, paddles his canoe across the lobby fountain of an Atlanta hotel, is threatened with death by locals, and runs for his life down the desolate, early morning streets of Manhattan, clad only in a cardboard box. Day-Lewis just had some good timing during filming. Even geniuses need to relax sometimes. Although Stars and Bars turned out to be a very mediocre film, some critics noted the actor's comedic talent. In 1988, Daniel joined a unique project, a film that would be a huge step in his personal growth and would raise his acting career to another level. It was the picture My Left Foot, the director and co-writer of which was the Irishman Jim Sheridan, for whom this picture was the directorial debut. After the success of several previous films, the actor was somewhat puzzled by how quickly everything happened. Unexpected fame, new prospects, and offers. So, he was in a state of certain frustration, refusing to take on new projects. But one day, Daniel found a script in his mailbox. Someone just put it there. He opened the envelope, read the first page of the script, and there was no turning back. Fascinated, he read the first lines, which described how a person puts a record on the record player, puts the needle on the track, and the melody begins to play. As if there is nothing unusual except for one detail. This person does it with his foot. I thought this was one of the most unusual first pages I'd ever encountered. I was delighted with it. Then I thought, how on earth could I do this? It's impossible. The script was a description of the real-life story of a boy born with cerebral palsy, Christy Brown, who could only fully control his left leg due to the disease. From an early age, the boy tried his best to prove to everyone that he's not a vegetable and has the same level of intelligence as other children of his age. Born in a poor family with many children, he learned to write and draw only with the help of his left leg, overcoming his own handicap and the prejudices of those around him. Such a difficult role was a tough nut to crack. To investigate it from the inside, Daniel rented a house near Sandy Mount School and Clinic in Dublin, a leading center for tr the treatment of the disabled, and spent a lot of time communicating with patients. There, he was looking for the image of his Christy Brown. He tried to understand his character on all levels, not just focusing on the outward behavior caused by a developmental disability. I didn't want the film to be about an actor's struggle to sustain disability when it's supposed to be about Christy's ability to transcend it. He says, that would make a nonsense of everything we were trying to do in the film. It was in this work that Daniel began to practice staying in the image of his character in order to get more deeply into the role. But many at that time considered it nothing more than excessive eccentricity and pretentiousness of Day-Lewis. This also became a reason for constant grumbling and dissatisfaction of many in the film crew because he caused them a lot of additional trouble. Surely physically, they had to carry his wheelchair to places where he couldn't use it himself, carry him in and out of the car, carry him over all the obstacles and cables that are numerous on every set, and even feed him with a spoon. All the time, he spoke out of one corner of his mouth, like a person whose facial muscles are not functioning as they should. The producers were freaking out because they couldn't understand a word he was saying. Being in a wheelchair all the time in an unnatural position for himself, twisting to use only his leg instead of his hands, the actor injured his back. In order to learn to write with only his foot as Christy did, Daniel used a knife. Although, as the director later recalled, the actor was never able to skillfully exercise his left leg, he used his right, and when he did it on camera, a mirror was used for filming. In the evenings, when Day-Lewis went to dinner in one of the posh restaurants in Dublin, he also remained in character, which made many people around him uncomfortable. But that's how he fully felt what a person with a disability went through when facing society. During the filming in which children with disabilities took part, he especially insisted that there was no one extra present on the set, as was usually done during the filming of scenes with naked nature. He didn't want them to feel any additional discomfort. However, if you don't focus on Christie's congenital deformity but approach the theme of the film at the level of universal values, Daniel understood very well what this story should be about. Everything about Christie's life story was noteworthy, but something stuck out to the actor the most when he was deciding whether to take on the role. The life of the town surrounding him, everything about it I was fascinated by, and just so particularly by his... And I, I, the interesting thing about the script, I think, it seemed to me anyway, that it, it was, that, that it wasn't a predominant feature, his disability. I, I was just struck by, m more than anything else, by his, by his anger at the way in which he was perceived and, and misunderstood sometimes, and his desire that, that the record should be set straight. Yeah. And I felt he was a pioneer 
in a way. He was actually charting territory which had never been charted before. And, uh, and I think my heroes have always been people that have, that have actually ventured into that kind of territory. And he was, um, and he never let up. He continued to confront people. He confronted his own fears, which takes huge courage. And, and he confronted other people's fears head on. In March 1990, at the 62nd Academy Awards ceremony, My Left Foot almost won the main award as the best film, losing to Driving Miss Daisy. But the Oscar for Best Actor went to none other than Daniel Day-Lewis. His opponents that year were Kenneth Branagh, Tom Cruise, Morgan Freeman, and Robin Williams. In addition to several Oscar and Daniel Award nominations, the film was also nominated for several BAFTA awards, where Day-Lewis again won Best Actor and a lot of other prestigious nominations and awards. My Left Foot, unexpectedly for its creators, created a sensation in the film world, and Daniel turned from a well-known actor into a superstar, and his life changed irreversibly. After such success, it was almost unreal to remain in the shadows, and the actor had to make more and more efforts in order to somehow preserve his very precious privacy. And of course, after he won an Oscar for his incredibly realistic portrayal of Christy Brown, the public talked about the great and mysterious method again. But Day-Lewis, as before and in many interviews after, avoided this loud word and simply said that he had his own way of working with the role. I don't follow the method. I don't even have a normal way of working. I tend to be suspicious of all systems of acting, so I was just trying to come to terms with the more extreme physical problems of playing someone who's disabled. While the press continued the commotion surrounding the Oscar-winning film and the mysterious Day-Lewis, the actor himself, having faithfully completed the press tour, went to Argentina. There he took part in the next project, the British-Argentinian dramedy Eversmile, New Jersey. He played the main role of an American dentist motorcyclist who went to Argentinian Patagonia to provide free dental services to the population. The character travels on a motorcycle and one day meets a local woman, which becomes the beginning of both a romantic relationship and a series of unexpected and surreal adventures. It wasn't a picture of Day-Lewis's level of talent. It was barely seen by the world community, but playing this part, Daniel was definitely relaxing on set, indulging in another one of his great lifelong passions. This hobby could be devoted to a whole huge chapter in the description of the actor's private life, and the title of this chapter would be Daniel and Motorcycles. From a young age, he was fascinated by everything related to motorcycles and motorsports. Among his own faithful two-legged steeds were American Harley-Davidson, British Triumph, including the 10140 Bonneville, dirt bikes, including the Suzuki 125. I like anything on two wheels. I enjoy violent sports, mainly football, English style, and I take the dirt bike around the fields and tracks, skidding in the mud. I love it. It's a great release. As for motorsport, here too, Day-Lewis approached the matter seriously. He does not just admire it as a spectator. In 2006, the actor experienced racing adrenaline by completing two full high-speed laps in the second seat of a Ducati MotoGP at Eastern Portugal behind multiple GP champion Randy Mamola. Being a huge fan of Valentino Rossi, he even jokingly calls himself his groupie. In 2007, Daniel rented a powerful Suzuki GSXR 1000 sport bike and raced at a speed of 120 miles per hour from Los Angeles to the track at Laguna Seca, and all in order to cheer for your idol in MotoGP, though he couldn't avoid motorcycle injuries. In 2017, the actor got into an accident on his motorcycle and broke his arm. It's no wonder that Day-Lewis is often compared to Marlon Brando, who's also considered a method actor, an eccentric, and a recluse, and who, like Daniel, adored motorcycles. Around Daniel Day-Lewis's life and acting, there have always been many myths about the method, about his women, about what he does when he disappears from the radar of the film community and world media. One of such myths, which can be conventionally called the Hamlet myth, is connected with the last play in Daniel's theatrical career. It was Shakespeare's Hamlet, in which he, in 1989, played the lead role of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, at London's National Theatre for a year. 1989 was not easy for Daniel in terms of acting and emotional load. The new director of the National Theatre, Richard Eyre, really wanted to involve Day-Lewis in the production of Hamlet, impressed by his role in Futurists. But Daniel was not given the role easily from the beginning. Besides, many criticized his way of reading Shakespeare's text. Therefore, the actor dropped out of the performance for three weeks in order to take part in the promotional campaign of the film My Left Foot, and after that, it was even more difficult for the young actor to rejoin the theatre process and one day he couldn't stand it. 
On Tuesday night, Daniel Day-Lewis, one of Britain's most exciting young actors, finished Act 1, Scene 5 of Hamlet at the National Theatre and, in a state of nervous exhaustion, now clinically diagnosed as stress syndrome, told the company that he could not go on. One can only imagine the outcry the press made after this incident. The mass media in advance told a spooky story that the actor played in this way due to a blackout of consciousness, because having completely immersed himself in the role, he saw the ghost of his dead father on the stage. Whether it's true or a press conjecture, one can only guess. Someone claims that Daniel's spoken about it himself then, in turn, Day-Lewis, when he agrees to answer at least something about the case, as his own version. Yes, even then, while playing this role, Daniel used his method of work, looking for something, some kind of hook, which he could cling to in order to tie himself more firmly to the understanding of the role. In Hamlet, this hook became the fact that his father, like Hamlet's father, died, continuing to remain an important figure in his son's mind. Daniel hung a photo of his father in his dressing room and addressed him, talked to him. The connection with his own deceased father gave him a deeper understanding of this connection in his character. If you're working in a play like Hamlet, you explore everything through your own experience. That correspondence between father and son, or the son and the father who's no longer alive, played a huge part in that experience. So yes, of course it was communication with my own dead father, but I don't remember seeing any ghosts of my father on that dreadful night. So there were no ghosts. But then why did Daniel, despite all his obligations as an actor hired to act in a play, allow himself to simply walk off the stage in the middle of an act? Day-Lewis didn't really set out to explain something to someone after that, although journalists chased after him and tracked him like hounds, tracked the hare. Jumping on the first train to Somerset, Daniel approached his closest person at the time, Sister Tamison, where, according to her own words, he lived with her and her family for about two months. As Daniel told many years later in an interview, answering a question about the famous Hamlet myth, I was working and living with that play for a year and a half of my life, and it's a weighty play to live with, so it didn't really surprise me that I got tired by the end. I work in a certain way, and I never really felt the need to explain it or apologize for it, but in England they thought I was unhinged. The press goes after you, and they don't tend to let go. Yes, after he ran off the stage and fell to the floor backstage in tears, the press really got on him. Journalists began to invent some stories about his relationship with his father, that in fact they were terrible, and Daniel had childhood trauma on this ground and much more. This time in the early 1990s was a period for Daniel when he felt his life was on pause because he wasn't sure how to move forward. On the one hand, there was cinema, in which he was now an Oscar-winning actor of A category, which imposed certain obligations and certain frameworks. And there was a theater to which, after the story with Hamlet, he knew even then that he was unlikely to return. It was a period of deep self-examination, which was helped by the bureaucratic formalities associated with the case of a breakdown at the performance of Hamlet, for which he had to talk about his situation in therapy sessions for some time. It was very helpful. I've always had a bloody-minded attitude towards feeling poorly. I was saved from choosing the darker avenue, which is always my preferred choice. I was encouraged to believe that I wasn't inherently demonic. The result was that he once again felt the desire to open up to new opportunities. Since the triumph of My Left Foot, the actor has constantly received some offers, none of which were good enough for him to accept, because from the beginning of his film career, Daniel was distinguished by a very meticulous selectivity regarding the projects in which he volunteered to participate. But he simply could not refuse one of the offers. It promised what he loved so much in life, the opportunity to discover something new for himself. In many interviews of Day-Lewis, the same word often slips by. Curiosity. This is what drives the actor not only in choosing roles, but also in what he does off-screen. If what he plays does not arouse this curiosity in him, he most likely will simply not waste time on it. In the same way, he chooses characters that defer in personality type, which allows him to discover a new side of himself. Certainly, they're, they're, they're certainly the things that most interest me tend to be um, at some distance from my own life, and they tend to be at some distance from the characters that have interested me before as well. And what could be more interesting than opening an unknown world from scratch? Because it was an offer to play in an epic adventure film based on James Fenimore Cooper's novel of the same name, The Last of the Mohicans. The role promised a new challenge, which was to be directed by Michael Mann, and Daniel plunged headlong into this opportunity. Despite the fact that Daniel had never expressed a desire to be involved in a big budget blockbuster, he agreed because Mann suggested focusing attention not so much on battle action as on love stories. The main line of the picture is the passion between the character of Day-Lewis, Nathaniel Hawkeye Bumpo, who was born by white settlers and adopted by Native Americans. 
and the daughter of a British colonel played by Madeleine Stowe. She paves her way against the backdrop of political intrigue, betrayal, loyalty to the principles and laws of honor. At a time when European civilization was just beginning to change the land of North America with its influence. I liked the idea of a man who had not been touched by 20th century neurosis, a life that isn't drawn inwards. Day Lewis, who after the experience with My Left Foot fully felt the effectiveness of his method of working with the role, this time went, perhaps, even further than he did with the role of Christy Brown. In The Last of the Mohicans, he had to raise himself to a completely different level of physical training in order to get used to the skin of a frontier man. A boy from an intelligent family, a pupil of a private school. He, of course, played sports as a teenager, but he never attached great importance to physical form. The only thing he was really close to was running. I've always loved to run. I mean, I've always... That's always been something that I've loved to do, and it was probably the one form of physical exercise that I was banned from doing most of the time when I wasn't actually shooting because uh, I was doing other forms of training and needed to put on some weight and I lose weight very easily and when I run I just disappear. <laughs> so uh, so it was, it was a kind of liberation for me when I was able to really kind of stretch my legs when we were filming. Uh, although Running through forests is very different to running on a track or running through a park or something because people don't make paths for you and they don't get boulders out of the way. To prepare for the role of Hawkeye, Day-Lewis spent six months working out with a fitness trainer five times a week to gain mass and the necessary physical form. He didn't just want to play Frontier Man, he wanted to be one. So, the actor spent another month living in the open air in the forests of North Carolina to feel for himself what it's like to be a child of the forest and depend only on his skills and the grace of Mother Nature. He also underwent separate training with a military expert, Colonel David Webster, a former Special Forces instructor who taught pilots survival skills in extreme situations. For a few months in 1991, his only student was Daniel Day-Lewis, whom he helped to master the skills of being, quote, an outdoorsman and a frontiersman. As if that was not enough, Daniel also received special training in the skills that the Native Americans possessed. Breeding tracks, setting traps, skinning hunted animals, fighting with tomahawks, making fire, and cooking. He even learned to build a canoe and skillfully row it. And this, he was helped by another expert, Benton Jennings, who not only knew all this, but according to Day Lewis himself, literally lived in the 18th century and was not just interested in reconstruction. In preparation for the role, the actor learned to use all types of weapons from modern automatic rifles to specific firearms and melee weapons of those times. Other filming participants mentioned that Day-Lewis was literally inseparable from the 12-pound flintlock rifle all this time, just as he was in the image of his character all this time, at least outwardly. There is even a legend that Daniel brought this gun home with him for Christmas dinner. The filming itself lasted almost four months and was incredibly physically exhausting, especially for Daniel due to the fact that he almost always lived the way his character should live. He slept little and ate little, and this is not only because of the tight schedule and difficult conditions. As the director Michael Mann recalled, if Daniel didn't shoot it, he didn't eat it. Daniel's partner on the set, Madeline Stowe, confirmed the actor's dedication during filming. This was a difficult film on everyone, especially on Daniel, and he never once, not once, complained. Day-Lewis got so used to the image of a frontier man and to life in the wild that during the filming and for some time after it ended, it was difficult for him to be in closed rooms. I find it difficult to be in rooms now for long periods of time. I can usually take it for about an hour. Then I stride out. But these efforts and certain sacrifices were not in vain. When The Last of the Mohicans was released in 1992, it definitely went down in history as one of the best action movies. The box office grossed many times the cost, and most critics were delighted, if not by the historical accuracy in following Fenimore Cooper's original, then by the incredibly dramatic and impeccably acted love line, the vividness of the staging of the battle scenes, and the stunning authenticity of Day-Lewis and the role of a brave and noble son of the forests. The picture had several Oscar nominations and won in the Best Sound category for its beautiful soundtrack. Day-Lewis was nominated for a BAFTA as Best Actor, losing to Robert Downey Jr. for his role in Chaplin. The film, although it did not bring Day-Lewis outstanding cinematography awards, renewed the actor's interest in acting, in the cinema, and the final choice was made, forever leaving his theater career in the past. Another plus was that in this role, Daniel convincingly showed himself capable not only of deep dramatic roles, but also of roles that required a certain physical training. 
Later, this will bring him other roles in which he'll appear in very bright, masculine characteristic images. Daniel himself, despite the fact that after the role of Hawkeye, he was often asked in interviews whether he currently saw himself in the role of a new Hollywood action hero, unequivocally answered in the negative. In almost every respect, I'd say no. I don't deal at all well with the relative amount of stuff I have to face already. I don't want to think about it because it only depresses me. Instead, as if to prove once again that being an action hero is far from his dream, almost immediately after the ending of filming in The Last of the Mohicans, he took part in a new project directed by Martin Scorsese where his role was as different from the previous one as possible. Actually, in 1993, Daniel Day-Lewis entered simultaneously with two films that were shot one by one. Having gladly volunteered to play the gentleman lawyer Newland Archer in Scorsese's film, he also promised his old friend Jim Sheridan, with whom they had previously shot My Left Foot, to join his new project. For Sheridan, he had to embody on the screen the image of a real character, the Irishman Jerry Conlon, one of the four falsely accused in the famous Guildford pub bombings that happened in 1974 in the film In the Name of the Father. And again, for the second time in his career, almost simultaneously, there were two different stories and completely different characters. And the point is not that Daniel had nothing to choose from and it just happened that way. The actor was followed by a series of very famous and high-grossing films in which he refused to act. Among them were such pictures as Pulp Fiction, Interview with the Vampire, Batman Forever, The English Patient, Shakespeare in Love, The Lord of the Rings, and several others. So the choice was always his alone. I really haven't done it on purpose, it's just that the characters I'm interested in rarely have anything in common with the characters I've played before. I don't set out to undergo some elaborate physical transformation, but the physical aspects of the part are related to all the other demands of the part, to the life of the person, and all people look different. In the case of Scorsese's offer, Daniel was a big fan of the director's talent since the release of Taxi Driver with De Niro in the lead role. Actually, it was this role of De Niro that the interest of Daniel and his classmates in the Stanislavski Method theater course began. So, when Scorsese offered the actor a role in his new film, a historical romantic drama, Day-Lewis didn't even think twice. And the Age of Innocence events take place in the American New York of the 19th century in the highest strata of its society. Newland Archer plans to marry a charming woman played by Winona Ryder, and everything would have gone according to plan if her cousin Elena, played by Michelle Pfeiffer, had not come to May. From the very first second of Newland and Elena's acquaintance, a passion arises between them, which later turns their whole life into a quiet hell because Archer is a worthy member of society who is used to doing the right thing, even if it goes against his heart's desire. The performance of Daniel and Pfeiffer is so emotionally intense that the pain of their characters is literally felt physically. There's not a single nude or candid scene in the film, and the episode where the two of them are in a carriage and Newland unbuttons only the buttons on Elena's glove to kiss her wrist can be safely classified as one of the most erotic scenes in cinema. In preparation for the role of Newland Archer, Daniel settled in the historic center of New York, walked everywhere with his walking stick, did not get out of the suits of the style of that era, wearing antique cologne. And so, from such an American gentleman of the 19th century, Daniel actually had to immediately transform into an Irish prisoner in Britain in the 1970s in In the Name of the Father. He had to play the role of the unjustly convicted Conlon. The script, again, promised an emotionally and physically complex, exhausting role. And the story itself was based on the story of a real person with whom Daniel had the opportunity to personally communicate with. From the beginning, the famous Irish actor Gabriel Byrne bought the rights to film this story, intending to play Conlon himself. But when he learned that Day-Lewis was interested in the role, he gave up the role without question, remaining the executive producer of the film. Conlon, a petty crook from Belfast who is forced by the police to confess and take the blame, the police charged four men, including Conlon, and these innocent people spent 15 years in prison. What is it like to be a prisoner? What is it like to serve years of cruel punishment as an innocent? To lose a father who dies here, nearby? also innocent, and also in a cell. Day-Lewis went to the extreme again to prepare for this role. The actor lost almost 40 pounds, and in order to better understand the life of a prisoner, he spent three days in a real prison cell. In addition, local thugs kept him awake there, banging on the door all night. He went through a real interrogation, which at his request was arranged for him by police officers. The interrogation lasted nine hours, and as if that wasn't enough, Daniel insisted that the members of the film crew pour cold water on him and verbally humiliate him in every possible way. 
During the entire period of filming, the actor communicated exclusively with a Belfast accent, both on and off the set. When asked why he was so extreme, Day-Lewis always answered, How could I understand how an innocent man could sign that confession and destroy his own life? What is done is done as part of the fascination for the subject and the world that one is trying to create. It's not like a sort of self-imposed torture. It's just a tool to stimulate the imagination, which is, finally, the only tool you ever have. Taking advantage of the fact that Gary Conley was a real person, the actor took the opportunity to meet and talk with him. Daniel spent hours in his company learning the manner of speech, the gestures. This helped him a lot in his work on the role, but at some point the actor caught himself getting so deeply into the character that he almost lost himself. There's always a certain difficulty in this. When the real story of a person is filmed, not to make a literal biographical copy, but to reproduce one's vision of the person in the situation, while at the same time not giving into the truth. There is a particular kind of responsibility which goes with that work, and um, it's a very delicate responsibility to play either a living person to represent their life or to represent the life of a, of a dead person whose memory is very dear to, to the living. Um, that is a responsibility, and it, and it has to be taken seriously. At the same time, it's also quite important not to be overwhelmed by that and to be able to interpret the life with a certain freedom and not feel bound to trying to represent it or imitate it in every one of its details. And I think that was understood by Jerry, that we had to part company and go our separate ways at a certain point. Both films, The Age of Innocence and In the Name of the Father, were simultaneously nominated in several categories at the 66th Academy Awards and at the BAFTA Awards. For his portrayal of Gary Conlon, Day-Lewis was nominated in the Best Actor category for both of these awards. But there was a whole series of nominations and victories for both films around the world. Although The Age of Innocence did not make the box office, critics gave the film high reviews, and In the Name of the Father at the same time conquered both critics and viewers who gladly voted with their wallets. These years full of work, nervously exhausting and illuminated by the increased attention of the press, were another test for Day-Lewis, because his personal life always provided topics so that the paparazzi did not give him peace for a minute. The favorite of women is the manly Hawkeye, the seductive Dr. Tomas, and the romantic Mr. Newland. The press created him the image of a love interest and a heartbreaker, always poking his nose at Daniel's dirty laundry. As much as he tried to keep his personal life a secret, both the truth and rumors regularly seeped into the pages of newspapers. After supposedly having a relationship with Juliette Binoche when he broke off a long-term relationship with Sarah Campbell in the early 1990s, he began an affair with another French beauty, Isabella Gianni. This relationship just happened to be 100% verified truth. They claimed that it was to Isabel that Daniel wrote romantic letters which he sealed with wax seals in the old-fashioned way. But the relationship was not equal. For her part, Isabel later called them, quote, a long period of emotional enslavement related to her disillusioned love affair with Daniel Day-Lewis. As usual, he refrained from commenting. But according to rumors, the couple's been together several times over the years and then broke up. It was all too emotional. But the actor, despite the fact that in those years he was in a relationship with Isabel, which could be characterized by the word tumultuous, the press regularly imposed other intrigues. Since Day-Lewis himself consistently refuses to comment on his personal life, we can only wonder what was true and what was made up by the paparazzi in pursuit of big headlines. So, after his filming in, in The Name of the Father, he was credited with an affair with the singer Sinead O'Connor, who participated in the creation of the soundtrack for the film. In her 2021 memoir, she admitted that she dedicated the song A Perfect Indian to him, inspired by his role in The Last of the Mohicans. In the same memoir, she wrote, It's not that I was in love with him, I wasn't, but I was very fond of him as a friend. The Age of Innocence brought rumors of a relationship with co-star Winona Ryder. Of course, they worked together, they were often seen together, they were friends, but none of them confirmed the affair in any way, and there's no real evidence of this. In the same period, the press raised waves about a probable affair between the world-famous pretty woman Julia Roberts and Day-Lewis. There came out a generally mysterious story, which everyone except, of course, Daniel himself, who was silent, told in different ways. The kernel of the story, which is known for sure, is that Roberts was supposed to star in the project Shakespeare in Love, and one of the potential candidates for the role of her co-star in the film was Day-Lewis. The producer of the picture, Edward Zwick, in his memories of the shooting, mentioned that after learning that Daniel was being considered for the role of Shakespeare, Julia became literally obsessed with the idea that Day-Lewis should play him. She was delighted. 
but he categorically refused to participate in the project, explaining it by the fact that he had already promised Sheridan to play him in, in the name of the father. According to the producer, after that, Julia did not stop her own attempts to attract Daniel. He's brilliant. He's handsome and intense and so funny. Did you see his performance in A Room with a View? He's done Shakespeare too. Don't you think he'd be perfect? I can get him to do it. She sent the actor roses and insisted on a personal meeting. Later, there were rumors that during the visit of the actress to Dublin, where Daniel was at that time, there was an affair between them. But other rumors claim that Roberts herself started the gossip about this affair. As a result, Daniel did not get the role of Shakespeare, and Roberts had no desire to play with other partners, which almost disrupted the entire production of the project. At the same time, the paparazzi often caught Day-Lewis in the company of his 26-year-old fitness trainer, Dea Picardo, who even moved to his New York apartment. And in the meantime, Day-Lewis, around whom such passions unfolded, and Isabella Johnny had a son, Gabriel Kane Day-Lewis, in 1995, a few months after they broke up. And there was also gossip because it was said that Daniel broke up with Isabel just by sending her a message by fax machine. It's not surprising that after the completion of shooting in the name of the father, tired of the paparazzi's attention to his private life, Day-Lewis immediately set about the next project, which promised him another escape from the public eye. It was the British director Nicholas Heitner's film The Crucible, based on the play by the great and terrible writer Arthur Miller, in which the actor had previously refused to participate. Filming was supposed to begin in early 1996, and a few months earlier, the actor went to a location lost among the lakes of northern Massachusetts to begin training for a new role. Daniel got the role of John Proctor, a strict and correct Puritan farmer of the 17th century from the infamous town of Salem. He's married, but succumbing to his short-term weakness, enters into a relationship with a young maid, played by Winona Ryder, a young woman wanting to bind Proctor to herself, half-jokingly conducts a witchcraft ritual with her friends. But this joke turns into a real process of witch hunting, which has affected a large number of decent residents, including Proctor. The plot of the drama drags with the depth of contradictions and the abyss of human nature, which Miller skillfully brought to light, and the acting of Day-Lewis, as always, did not leave the audience and critics indifferent. Day-Lewis doesn't have any tricks to rely on this time. Even his New England accent is understated, but in scenes like the one where he confesses his adultery in court, he burrows into the soul of John Proctor's stubborn decency, his unwillingness to grasp that the truth is the last thing that's going to protect him. What was behind the preparation for the role of John Proctor, apart from trying to understand the psychological portrait of the character? What did Day-Lewis use this time to get closer to the world of his hero? Daniel's tanned and weathered face, his worn, calloused hands, which we see in the film footage, are not makeup. Months before the start of filming, the actor came to northern Massachusetts and settled there on Hog Island, an uninhabited bird sanctuary in Ipswich Bay where the film crew was just starting to build the sets of Colonial Salem in 1692. The actor personally helped build the wooden house in which his character lived and other parts of the scenery of the settlement using only 17th century tools. He remained living there on the island without electricity and running water, trying to arrange his life as it was established in those times. It seemed that the important thing to do was some kind of physical work, so I spent some time on the island because so much of the story of those people's lives was contained within the way they took possession of that land. After the summer spent on the island, he completely immersed himself in his character. Day-Lewis didn't talk much. Instead of using a golf cart to get around the island as other actors did, he rode exclusively on his brown horse. In the frame, he was mowing the grass for real because he learned how to do it. Unfortunately, although the film received a lot of positive reviews from critics and several of the most prestigious awards and nominations, including an Oscar nomination for the best screenplay, it was a complete failure at the box office. What else did participation in this film bring to Day-Lewis, apart from a break from society and immersion in a new world for him with the actor's constant curiosity? One of the reasons why Daniel still agreed to participate in the project was the author of the film's script, Arthur Miller, who was a real legend for Day-Lewis and whom he got a chance to meet personally. They not only met, but also corresponded for a long time about the role and the script. A few months later, on November 13th, 1996, on the eve of the movie release, Daniel, unexpectedly for everyone, and especially for Dea Picardo, who at that time still lived in his New York apartment and considered herself his girlfriend, married a writer, actress and director Rebecca Miller, the daughter of a great writer. The couple met during the filming of The Crucible and soon decided to get married without too much fuss and lavish ceremonies. Daniel was 39 at that time, Rebecca was 33. 
Rebecca's half-brother, Robert Miller, who acted as a producer of the film, said even then that they had every chance to become an ideal couple. They should be good for each other. They're both very creative people. They're independent and yet also very loving and very bright. Most likely he turned out to be right, because 27 years have passed since their wedding, and they're still together, have two children, sons Ronan Cal and Cashel Blake, and are just as vigilant in keeping the paparazzi away from their personal life. In the 90s, Daniel had not yet made a habit of taking long breaks between movies, as he would later do, so immediately after The Crucible, he joined Jim Sheridan's new project and their third collaboration. Day-Lewis cut his hair almost bald and moved to Ireland where he was supposed to play the boxer Danny Flynn, a former IRA fighter in the film The Boxer. Sheridan wrote the script partly based on the story of a real character, Irish boxer, featherweight champion Barry McKeegan, who became Daniel's trainer in preparation for the role. I wanted to know what I could make of this, if there was anything in me for it, because I didn't see the point in doing the film unless I could really learn to fight. The actor started working with McKeegan long before the idea of the film was even up there. They met, thanks to Sheridan, several times over a beer, they all discussed the possibility of filming the boxer's story, and even then, Daniel wanted to just try to start boxing. So by the time the script was put into work, Day-Lewis had already been in intensive boxing training for over a year. In total, the actor devoted almost three years to boxing, preparing for the film. And just like in everything that Day-Lewis undertook, he tested himself for strength here as well, getting used to the role to the maximum. After 16 weeks of filming, which lasted until July 1997, McKeegan confidently asserted that the actor, who had sparred more than 400 rounds in total during this time, was ready to fight seriously in the professional ring and would have every chance to become a professional boxer if he had such a desire. McKeegan was impressed by Day-Lewis's dedication to his craft and his persistence in preparing for the role. Daniel doesn't do anything easy. He trained like a nut. He trained harder than any fighter that I've ever worked with. Daniel worked twice a day, seven days a week. I said, Daniel, you don't have to make it this tough. He said, look, in order for me to understand what a fighter goes through, I have to simulate what it's like. This was all day Lewis, but in addition to purely physical training, he also tried to find an approach to the difficult personality of his character. The key to how to convey the chemistry that was supposed to be on the screen between him and his screen partner who was played by Emily Watson. According to the story, the characters of Daniel and Emily have not seen each other for 14 years, as much as Danny Flynn spent in prison. From the very beginning of filming, Daniel agreed with Emily that they would hardly talk. At first, the actress perceived this request as something too demanding and uncomfortable, like the entire method of Daniel's work on the set. Daniel and I didn't really speak. I found that difficult. I found it quite lonely and isolating and a bit scary. He has a sort of electric force about him and it's intimidating but amazing to watch. It really was as it was in the story. It's a spare, brutal world where people don't express themselves. But later, after many years, having gained more of her own acting experience, she already looked at it in a completely different way. As the actress mentioned in an interview, she was grateful to fate for this experience. Once, she asked Day Lewis, why do you work like that? To which he modestly replied, well, I don't think I'm a good enough actor to be able to not do it this way. The boxer was nominated for three Golden Globe Awards, one of which was Day Lewis's nomination for Best Actor. Critics generally welcomed the film, and it did not lose at the box office. But for some reason, the film was not talked about as much as other projects in which the actor starred in those years. But Daniel, as always, invested a lot of himself in this film, and considering that he already had a family, Rebecca was waiting for the appearance of their firstborn son, Ronan, who would be born in 1998. The actor decided to simply disappear from the radar. Literally. They got together and moved to Florence, Italy, and Day Lewis disappeared from the screens and from the front pages of the press for five years. I just felt it was time to... to work away at other things for a while. And I didn't know how long it would be for. I, I knew that I was going to stop for a while and keep out of the game, but I really didn't know how long it would be for. And I have no concept of time. I'm very... <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm wasteful with time, I don't know, but I, 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 it was really quite shocking to me when somebody said, you know, why didn't you do anything for five years? And I, I just didn't, I didn't feel mm. the time passing. What was Daniel doing all this time? Well, he just enjoyed life. This was his first, and far from the last, experience of being removed from the world of cinema for quite a long time. The actor gave himself so much on the set that he barely had enough to withstand the mandatory PR company that followed the next picture. 
I know this is part of what we have to do, but I really have to be forced. I just want people to go and see the film, and I hope that they like it. I've done my part, and once I'm finished, I always feel a little empty inside. So, having endured the necessary number of interviews and public appearances, Daniel allowed himself to enjoy the company of his wife, put his face in the Mediterranean sun, devote time to his favorite cabinet making, and master the art of cobbler from scratch. Another strangeness for the already strange Day Lewis, who is used to be perceived as for his love for solitude and a specific style of working with the role. But why shoemaking? In an interview with Rolling Stone magazine, he called all his passions for craftsmanship a kind of antidote to his acting work and everything related to it. Most particularly, perhaps, because you see this visible evidence, you have this tangible thing at the end. And if you fuck up, you can see it very clearly and do it again. It's not a matter of opinion. It's either good or it's bad. So, Florence and Daniel, as an apprentice to shoe maestro Stefano Bemmer, who was considered the best at the time, and a pair of leather brogues made in his workshop in those years, costs as little as $500. Maybe Day Lewis would have continued to enjoy this vacation from acting, if not for Martin Scorsese, who once again wanted the Oscar winning genius for a role in his new film, the epic historical drama Gangs of New York. Though, for the role of Bill the Butcher, Scorsese initially approved Robert De Niro and Daniel was planned for another role. But considering that the entire project, from the first approval to the actual finished film, took almost 20 years, De Niro refused to participate because he could not wait any longer and had commitments to other projects. 20 years is a huge period of time, but the director did not give up. The problems were that with such a large-scale idea, the need for a large number of scenery and costumes, it was difficult to find the necessary funding. In addition, the rights to the picture were transferred from studio to studio more than five times, until Miramax Films finally took over the project. Day-Lewis, who agreed to a smaller role because it was Martin Scorsese, was happy to take on one of the main characters of the picture. The role of the extraordinary, maniacally violent, faithful to the principles of the dying era, the leader of the Brit gang, William Cutting, whom everyone called Butcher. It was precisely for this reason that Day-Lewis refused the role of Aragorn in The Lord of the Rings, because firstly, this is Scorsese, and secondly, this Butcher was already very bright. And this is not only due to the external image created by the actor, but because he tried to understand him more deeply and on a more subtle level, to judge his actions not by the standards of our time, but from the point of view of those times. Because w looking at something like this, we would tend to judge those people with the ethics that we live with exactly. today. Exactly. Yeah, it's a very different, we could uh, easily time. ignore yeah. the fact that they were living with a very structured code of ethics, even within the apparent chaos and yeah. anarchy yeah. of that place and that time that there was, a, there was a real sense of honor. There were things you did, things you didn't do. Mm -hmm. It seems as if anything goes there, but that's not true. Mm -hmm. And Daniel did not miss, because his William Cutting is remembered better than all the other, even the main, heroes of the picture. Needless to say, Day-Lewis once again resorted to his own way of finding a connection with the character. Filming began in the winter of 2000 in Rome and ended in the spring of 2001. All this time, Day-Lewis was the butcher, spoke with a strange accent, was learning to touch the tip of a knife to his eye, as Bill's was glass, and for about six months before that had been looking for something to use for his method. It can be six or eight months, it's been longer. People talk, apparently on my behalf, about this torturous preparation period, but it misses the point, because for me it's sheer pleasure. Butchery wouldn't be my first choice, but anything that involves very particular skills. You watch a butcher sharpen a knife, and it's a thing of beauty. The actor was, again, always in character and off the set, which sometimes scared the crew to the point of shivering, because being in the orbit of the butcher's changeable and explosive character was another pleasure. This time, he learned to skillfully sharpen knives, dismember pig carcasses, dressed according to the fashion of the 60s of the 18th century, did not leave the set, and continued to play even after DiCaprio accidentally broke his nose during the filming of a fight scene. In order to learn to skillfully throw knives, as the butcher did, Daniel hired an instructor from a circus troupe. He was so faithful to the character that he even caught pneumonia because the clothes he wore and which corresponded to the role were too light for filming in winter Rome. And as if that were not enough, the actor refused to take modern medicines, seriously risking not only his health, but also his life. But fortunately, everything worked out. Even Scorsese was impressed by how much Daniel grew with his character. I would have him over for dinner while we were shooting, and even though he'd be in modern clothes, it would still be very much like Bill might dress. Off camera or on the telephone, I'd always feel like I was talking to Bill, although he also had an override mechanism in which he can talk about the part. 
Gangs of New York became an event. Scorsese once again confirmed his reputation as a great director, and Day-Lewis is an exceptional actor who can play any role, even the antagonistic character and the biggest villain, in such a way that the audience will take their breath away. No, that time it wasn't an Oscar again, but the picture received 10 nominations. Day-Lewis received his third Best Actor nomination and was recognized at this year's BAFTA as Best Actor. In 2002, when the picture was released and Day-Lewis was again connected to the promotion company, he and Rebecca had a second son, Cashel Blake Day-Lewis. His first son from his relationship with Isabella Johnny, Gabriel Kane, was already seven years old at that time. Although the boy was born in New York, soon his mother took him with her to Paris, and at that time she and Daniel saw each other, but not often enough. After the resounding success of Gangs of New York, the actor again felt that he had given his best and, having the experience of escaping to Italy, this time he decided to find a more permanent shelter for himself and his family, to build the family nest. As far as possible from Hollywood, and at a certain distance from Britain, places where the press always crowded around him. In 2003, Day-Lewis bought a house and a piece of land in his beloved Ireland, in County Wicklow, among heather-covered mountain slopes. Now the family spend most of their time in this house, occasionally visiting New York. Daniel himself has been a citizen of Ireland since 1987, and it was only a matter of time before he decided to settle there. But this did not mean that he gave up on Britain. Yes, I do have dual citizenship, but I think of England as my country. I miss London very much, but I couldn't live there because there came a time when I needed to be private and was forced to be public by the press. I couldn't deal with it. But why, in fact, Ireland? One of the reasons, according to his own words, is vivid childhood memories of this region, of how they spent summer vacations with the whole family in County Mayo. There, his father was always happy, returning to the places where he was born. Remembering those times, Daniel usually smiles and begins to tell about the boundless delight he felt as a child when they flew out of the car, arrived at the place, and ran to dive into the Atlantic. About lighting, smells that still remain in memory from those cloudless days. Life in England, compared to these memories, always seemed a bit dull. I was probably four years old when I first um, went with my father, with my family, to, to the west of Ireland. Um, he wasn't from the west, actually. He was from, from County Leash, which had been yeah. called Queen's County in the old days. And from an early age, we began to think of it as being a place that was, if not home, certainly as close to home and perhaps something almost better than home, which was a sanctuary, a place that you could escape to and always find what you were looking for, a certain quietude and... And, and I grew up in England, and I, I, I mean, I am, by culture and education, an Englishman, and I've never tried to deny it, but I suppose some sen in some sense, and I might share this with a lot of people that work in the performing arts, I, I felt a sense of alienation within my own society. Um, and something about the nature of the class system there appalled me, as it had done my parents, too. And... Uh, Ireland always beckoned throughout the years, and I was fairly confident that at some time I would move over there. So, having arranged his own refuge in a secluded corner of Ireland for himself and his family, he now had a wonderful place to spend his time in between working on films, and these periods became longer and longer over the years. This time, Day-Lewis took a three-year break between projects. Daniel himself, contrary to how it used to be presented in the mass media, does not divide his life in front of the camera and off it into two separate universes. He simply changes the situation, but he remains the same. It's just that having to step away from acting from time to time is part of who he is. He's so comfortable with it and has every right to do so. Something that's been suggested on my behalf is that I live an almost bipolar existence, with the public life of filmmaking on one side and a sort of reclusive, almost misanthropic life on the other. But it never appears to me that there's any chasm, any rift between those two worlds. My life, to me, contains both the professional and the personal very easily. Perhaps this break of three years after filming in Scorsese would have lasted even longer if it were not for Daniel's wife. She persuaded her husband to act in her new film, The Ballad of Jack and Rose, which was released in 2005. Rebecca Miller, at the time of their acquaintance with Day-Lewis, was not only the daughter of the famous American writer Henry Miller, but also a director, and The Ballad of Jack and Rose was to become her third movie. This film, in terms of its scale, did not quite fit into the type of projects that the actor usually pursued. Because of this, it's said that his family relationship with Rebecca played a key role in the fact that he agreed to play in it. He was involved in this project of hers from the beginning because he was the first to read the script, which was also written by Rebecca. She shared her thoughts with her husband during the creation process, so when the idea and the script were finally formed, it was easy for her to persuade him to join the filming and he gladly took part in it. But he was okay with it, as he really liked the script. 
The only thing they both feared at the beginning was that it might be difficult to work together as director and actor, given their close relationship. In this drama, Daniel got the role of a hippie, a single father who lives in the ruins of a commune on an island on the east coast with his teenage daughter, played by Camila Bell. The relationship between father and daughter, the war with developers, the struggle with his own, probably fatal disease. This time, Daniel did not impress the paparazzi either with spectacular external transformations or extreme physical exertion in preparation for the role. For this role, Day-Lewis separated himself from his family for a while, in order to feel how important this connection between children and parents is. But they were all together at the filming, so it wasn't as dramatic as the paparazzi made it out to be. In a certain way, I mean, I had a shack on the, on the waterfront about two miles down, uh, down the coastline from, from the set, and I kind of repaired to that during the week. and. But I mean, I'd come back after the day's shoot, I'd come back and, right. and to where Rebecca and the kids were and spend some time there and then go off to my little chase. Yeah. But it, that, seemed to, that seemed to work out well. It was just really to retain a sense of isolation, which is always so hard to find on <laughs> a movie set. Yeah. And um, that's important to you? Well, it was certainly important to this story, yeah. It was, it was vital. It was central to it. The film did not bring either a successful box office or an unequivocal reaction from critics. Some moderately praised, some moderately criticized. So in terms of the reaction to his participation in the project, for an actor of the caliber of Day-Lewis, it was really a fairly neutral work, although the film turned out beautiful and deep in its own way. But the very next picture in which he took part, again, made the whole world talk about the mystery and power of Day-Lewis's talent. Two years later, in 2007, the drama There Will Be Blood by the American director Paul Thomas Anderson was released on world screens. Actually, Anderson wanted to involve Day-Lewis in this project as soon as possible so much that he even sent him a not yet fully polished version of the script. But even this was enough for Daniel to get fired up to play this role. The role of the stubborn prospector Daniel Plainview, who in the search, first for gold and then for oil, having achieved the dream of wealth and power, finally loses his humanity, principles, and decency. The mysterious and surrounded by a million rumors method of Day-Lewis, and in this picture, did not bring him to the extreme that the audience eagerly expected from him, whispering to each other, quote, well, what else is that strange Britain doing on the set? What will he invent again to get into the role? From the time he accepted the role until the film was financed, Daniel lived in his home in Ireland and worked on the role mostly with the help of his own imagination. No matter what stimulus you can find that belonged to that world, that world that you're trying to imagine, Finally, imagination is the only thing that's going to take you there. I had time and a quiet place and neutral surroundings. I've got a room at home where I can really daydream without being disturbed, and I suppose it's there where things ferment. It's funny, but even the remoteness of the actor from the filming location did not stop gossipers from absurd fabrications. It was rumored that Day-Lewis, in order to physically experience the role, had personally set up a cattle pit in his Wicklow backyard. Oddly enough, he didn't do anything that special this time. Well, he spent three days choosing the hat that he was supposed to wear out of five options, and then he didn't take it off all the time when he was in the character of Daniel Plainview. The actor worked more carefully to understand the era and what motivated people to this difficult task. Most of the story takes place in Southern California, from the turn of the century to the 1920s. As most actors would do, he read the book on which the script was based, the novel Oil, written by Upton Sinclair. In addition, Daniel studied in detail in the archives the correspondence of real people from those times who, extracting oil, literally lived in these holes in the ground which they dug with their own hands. In personal correspondence with their families and loved ones, these people described not only their everyday life, but also their hopes and dreams, fears, and disappointments. The actors studied the photos of that time in detail, paying attention to clothes, everyday life, and work tools set themselves on that course. I mean, there's nothing, you, you learn as you go along. They were learning as they, as they went along. You, you buy the tools, you buy a donkey if you've got enough money. You probably, if you can find a partner, that's okay, but otherwise you just do it on your own and you make it up as you go along. And, and even that, that, when you see him at the beginning, he's a silver prospector, but then, then the whole oil thing, you know, b before you get into the industrialization, um, uh, of, of, of oil production, it's really just 
the process of scooping it out of the ground where it emerges naturally into pools with buckets and saucepans. And yeah. Day Lewis also paid considerable attention to finding a voice for his character. He spent dozens of hours listening to old audio recordings of people from that region and time period that have survived to this day. He recorded his voice samples to understand how he would sound. Finding a hero's voice in general seems very important in Daniel's work. He did this with the butcher, choosing a specific accent for him, and would do it a little later with Lincoln. Because in fact, the voice is as essential a part of everyone as gestures and mannerisms. I like to have the illusion that I can hear that voice before I'm able to speak with that voice. I do use a little tape recorder. I talk to myself a lot. I try without thinking about it to have a sense of whether that voice belongs to me in my new life. Finally, I just began to hear a voice which seemed to be right. I couldn't make the sounds initially. I could hear them, but I couldn't make them. Nevertheless, it was not possible without everything going a little out of bounds. At the very beginning of filming, after two weeks of work, the actor Kel O'Neill, who was supposed to play the bitter enemy of Daniel Plainview, left the project. It is said that this happened because Kel could not stand the intensity that Day-Lewis put into his acting and the relationship between them on the set. O'Neill was replaced by Paul Dano, who, according to rumors, Daniel threw real bowling balls at in the heat of one of the scenes. His other co-star was 10-year-old Dylan Frazier, who played his on-screen son, H.W. Since the boys never acted in a movie, Daniel always wanted to somehow take care of him, at least according to the actor. He was a 10-year-old man-child, and he had a great head on his shoulders and a pair of hands like shovels. I dare say he could have knocked me out if he wanted to. He was a wonderful, self-possessed, beautiful young man. They really became friends, and before a very difficult scene in which Plainview had to treat H.W. very harshly, the actor decided to explain to the boy what and why, and to say that despite everything he said to him in the frame, he actually loved him. This was where Dylan finally showed character and forever discouraged Daniel from showing excessive care for him, almost sending him away. For the opening scene in which Plainview was looking for a piece of silver in the California desert, Day-Lewis had to go down into a real mine, excavated specifically for filming, and dig and ship with his own hands, because he was used to going through all the experience on his own. But during one of the takes, the actor fell from a height of 50 feet, breaking a rib. If you collect all the enthusiastic reviews of critics about the performance of Day-Lewis in There Will Be Blood, you can probably publish a small book. And next to it, put on the shelf of a shining Oscar statuette, the second one in the actor's career. It's a thrilling performance, among the greatest I've seen, purposefully alienating and brilliantly located at the juncture between cinematic realism and theatrical spectacle. Yes, he already received his second highest award at the Film Academy. At the time, it was only the 10th time in the history of the Academy Awards that an actor had won two Best Actor awards. In this, Day-Lewis joined a constellation that included such movie superstars as Spencer Tracy, Gary Cooper, Marlon Brando, Jack Nicholson, and Dustin Hoffman. But he did it in his own style, popping into the spotlight from time to time, as if out of nowhere, on the wave of noise and admiration caused by his next appearance on the screen and disappearing again for several years. An Oscar-winning star who, at the same time, is not a Hollywood star. Only Day-Lewis can do that. The Golden Globe Award, Screen Actors Guild Award, and many other nominations and awards were added to the Academy Award. And Day-Lewis politely thanked everyone for the Oscar and once again quietly disappeared from the radar of moviegoers for a couple of years, coming to his senses after an exhausting role. But a year later, in the spring of 2008, after receiving an offer to try himself in a completely new genre for himself, he sent the producers a video in which he sang. Perhaps it was his curiosity again that was his driving force that pushed the actor to try himself in a musical. I follow my curiosity, and it takes me into all kinds of strange places, and I satisfy that curiosity as much as I can when I'm working. And, and I do it for the simple reason that there are things I need to know and understand for my own sake to be able to, if I feel I'm going to take on the life of another man. In 2009, the romantic musical drama Nine was released, inspired by the film Eight and a Half by maestro Federico Fellini, and in which Day Lewis played the main character, film director Guido Contini. In addition to the fact that the musical was something completely new for the actor, the project had several undeniable trump cards for him. First, the film was directed by none other than Rob Marshall, whose other musical Chicago won an Oscar. Secondly, the main character on the screen was to be surrounded by a galaxy of beautiful women, his muses and his lovers, Nicole Kidman, Marion Cotillard, Penelope Cruz, Kate Hudson, Fergie, Judi Dench, and film diva Sophia Loren as Guido Contini's mother. 
One can only imagine the challenges faced by Day-Lewis in preparation for this picture, but those, for the most part, were purely technical difficulties. He had a strong voice but lacked skill. Therefore, for the first eight weeks, or even more, the actor practiced vocals with the movie's music director in order to choose for Day-Lewis the manner of performance that would work best for him and would not be in dissonance with his character. As a result, we can enjoy two songs performed by Daniel Day-Lewis himself on the official soundtrack to the film. Another problem was the choreography. Here, the actor decided not to even try to jump above his head, which was supported by Rob Marshall. I kind of climb in time to the music. That luckily was something that Rob didn't try and convince either himself or me of, that he'd found a dancer. So he worked around that in my case. I was quite relieved that I could concentrate on the music. In other respects, he followed the familiar routine of familiarizing himself with the character. He tried to be in the role of his hero not only on set, but also outside it. Wore Aguido's suit, smoked cigarettes, practicing for himself the manner in which Guido should do it. It is said that he wrote his co-star's cute complimentary notes in the style of Guido. His dressing room was decorated and furnished as the office of a film director in the 60s should have looked. Of course, there were a lot of regular press rumors, this time about the fact that the actor learned Italian in order to get used to the role of the character. Daniel was frankly amused by these rumors, because as he himself said later in an interview, considering that both the preparation for the film and the filming itself took no more than a year, he simply did not have time to learn the language, even if he wanted to. Because in order to master the language at the level at which he would consider it acceptable, it would take at least five years. Also, given that he once lived in Italy for five years, he could speak some Italian anyway, which allowed him to deftly add a slight flair of an Italian accent to his character. The most extravagant rumors seem to develop out of almost every piece of work that I ever take on, and although some of them might have some basis in truth, they're very often unrecognizable to me. I wish I could claim that I had. I'm so tempted to lie about it. Unfortunately, despite the megastar cast and hopes invested in it, the picture did not repeat the glory of Chicago. Reviews from critics were quite mixed, but far from enthusiastic, and the film did not come close to bringing in the expected profits. Perhaps of all the works of Day-Lewis of this scale and budget, this was the most unsuccessful work in terms of its reception by the public, although it was his performance, as well as the performance of Cotillard and Cruz, that was mostly praised by film critics. And despite everything, Daniel was also nominated for this role at the Golden Globe Award and at the Satellite Award as Best Actor. After that, the actor disappeared for three years, only to return to Hollywood after a moderate ovation for his role in Nine for another Oscar. This time, the role was offered by Steven Spielberg, and it was not just big, it was epic. Long-bodied, thin, with a long neck and legs, this is what Abe Lincoln looked like according to his biographers. Such is Day-Lewis, who is the closest in physique to the great president of any actor who has ever played Lincoln before. The height of Lincoln, who was considered almost a giant for his time, 6 feet 4 inches, Daniel's not much less, 6 feet and 1 and a quarter inch. In addition, to match the actor's face to Abe's appearance, almost no makeup was needed. Day-Lewis's own hair and beard, cut and styled as Lincoln wore the famous birthmark, and that's pretty much all that was needed. Spielberg was struck by this similarity. When he and the screenwriter Tony Kushner arrived to persuade the actor to take the role, they all went to a pub together, and, as Daniel and Tony stood in the background of the window and talked, Spielberg, as if spontaneously, clicked a photo of Day-Lewis on his phone and dropped it to Kushner by email. Steven said that his earliest memory of Lincoln was a cardboard cutout of his silhouette for President's Day. This silhouette of Daniel against the window, you would absolutely think you were looking at young Abe Lincoln. In general, Spielberg made several attempts to persuade the actor to participate in the project of Lincoln. The first time was in 2003, then the script was completely different. There was very little Lincoln in it, and more attention was paid to the Civil War. In addition to the fact that Daniel did not like the script, he also insisted that the idea of him playing the great president was complete nonsense. The director made the next attempt six years later, when Tony Kushner was already working on a new script. This time, the story was briefly based on the 2005 biography of Lincoln, written by Doris Kearns Goodwin. The script described only the last months of the president's life when he worked to push through Congress the 13th Amendment to end slavery. This scenario intrigued Day-Lewis, and although he initially refused again, it was too late. As he said himself, I had already been drawn into Lincoln's orbit. He has a very powerful orbit, which is interesting because we tend to hold him at such a distance. He's been mythologized almost to the point of dehumanization, but when you begin to approach him, he almost instantly becomes welcoming and accessible, the way he was in life. That's when the work began. 
This time, in order to prepare for the role, Day-Lewis did not try to master any practical skills that the character possessed. Preparation consisted largely of reading. Among the books were the writings of Lincoln himself, the reminiscences of contemporaries, and of course, a biography of Abe written by Doris Goodwin. In addition, the actor especially went on a tour of the house and law office of the young Lincoln in Springfield, Illinois. He paid special attention to the study of photographs of the 16th president taken at the end of his life by photographer Alexander Gardner. I looked at them the way you sometimes look at your own reflection in a mirror and wonder who that person is looking back at you. The actor recollected. Another way to Lincoln's personality was the president's voice. While there was historical evidence that Lincoln had a high-pitched voice rather than the thick, booming baritone he was usually voiced by in film and animation, Day-Lewis had his own theory about it. According to his observations, high-pitched voices are better perceived by the crowd. Such a voice is better heard in a larger area. The actor assumed that Lincoln was such an effective orator partly thanks to such a comfortable speaking tone. Daniel has walked this path of searching for the character's spirit more than once and has definitely confirmed the effectiveness of this method for himself. The voice was always very important to him. With the voice being such a deep personal reflection of character, of who mm. we are, mm -hmm. And that voice may be quite a surprising reflection of who we seem to be uh, in some cases, but it is undoubtedly, it's, it's, it's kind of a fingerprint of the soul. One day, Spielberg just received a voice recorder in the mail in an envelope marked, For Your Eyes Only. On the recording was a voice reading something from Shakespeare in Lincoln's second inaugural. It was Lincoln's voice, not the one that many imagined when looking at the official portraits of the 16th president of the United States in textbooks. It was a voice very similar to the one described in the memories of his contemporaries. A soft tenor, a little too high, a little cracked, and the accent of which a border mixture of Illinois, Indiana, and Kentucky dialects was easily read. A beautiful voice. I wanted that voice to read me a book. It came with a letter that said, After you listen to this, would you ring me up and we'll have a natter? That was the result of Daniel's process. I never questioned him about how he arrived at the voice. I simply accepted that voice as the 16th president of the United States. To get used to this voice, Day-Lewis used it all the time, on set, between scenes, and even for some time after the work was finished. The actor didn't just play Lincoln. In order to play Abe at the level of skill he did, he had to literally become Lincoln for a while. He insisted that the entire film crew address him as Mr. President, with his co-star in the film actress Sally Field, who played the president's wife. He even exchanged text messages in the image and style of Abe. She remembered how he often sent her some funny limerick signed, Yours, A and she had to reply to him on Mary's behalf, as she, his wife, would have done, scolding him for wasting his time on such nonsense, instead of concentrating on something more meaningful. Over the years, Day-Lewis's somewhat maniacal method of immersing himself in the role was, thanks to the tabloids, familiar to almost everyone on the set, so no one was surprised by the actor's specific requirements. Screenwriter Tony Kushner later recalled how Daniel, with whom they had a friendly relationship, warned him before the start of filming that from the beginning of the shooting process he would not talk to him, only to Spielberg. Tony remembers very vividly the scene they filmed right at the beginning, one of the most important in the film, where Lincoln explains to his cabinet the importance of passing the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. According to Kushner, everyone literally had their breath taken away when the scene was filmed. He also claimed that it was the greatest performance he had ever seen in his life, and in order to play like that, an actor must be there, at that moment, completely in the highest concentration. This is not psychosis. This is art. Is it really so necessary to stay completely in the role all the time? Kushner claimed that yes, it has its own meaning and its own logic. He expressed the opinion that actors of this level are a kind of sacrificial animal, because he'd never seen a great actor play a great role for which he would pay a great price. In order to list all the awards that Lincoln received, a whole separate page is opened in Wikipedia, and the big bunch of these awards belongs to Day-Lewis as the actor who played the famous president. And among them, the third Oscar. When the filming was finished and the promotional campaign of the picture began, Day-Lewis still did not want to part with one of his greatest roles. He admitted that it was very sad and difficult for him to leave his Lincoln behind. Without sounding unhinged, I know I'm not Abraham Lincoln. I am aware of that. But the truth is, the entire game is about creating an illusion. And for whatever reason, and as mad as it may sound, some part of me can allow myself to believe for a period for time without questioning. And that's the trick. Shortly after winning the Oscar for his role as Lincoln, Day-Lewis announced that he would take a break from acting and return to his farmhouse in Ireland. He disappeared from the screen for up to five years, the longest interval between filming and his career. 
But the actor did not manage to completely avoid publicity during these five years because in 2014, Daniel Day-Lewis was awarded the honorary title of Knight and the Queen's Birthday Honors. But to the great regret of the press, nothing more could be extracted from this event than Sir Daniel's brief remark when he first learned of the honor he had received that he was entirely amazed and utterly delighted in equal measure. Three years after receiving the knighthood, in 2017, Day-Lewis reappeared on the screen in Paul Anderson's Phantom Thread, stunning in its visual sophistication and shocking denouement. But it's not a return to me. I never went away. I never left myself. I simply need the time I spend not working in films, the time away, to do the work that I love to do and the way that I love to do it. Day Lewis and Paul Anderson had the idea of this film for several years. The director had a story about a man who becomes strangely dependent on his mistress, about an emotionally strained relationship between him, his sister, and his muse. Later, together with Daniel, they decided that the protagonist should be a fashion designer, and together they plunged into the unfamiliar world of high fashion, creating a kind of perverted, twisted version of the story of Cinderella. Sometime in 2015, a couple of years before filming began, Day-Lewis began immediate preparation for the role. As it turned out later, it was his last film role. But at that time, Daniel didn't even think about making the decision that he would not continue acting. To transform into Woodcock, the actor studied the lives of famous designers, watched archive videos from fashion shows of the 1940s and 50s, learned to draw sketches, sew with his own hands, and design dresses. I've explored so many different worlds, but the thing they have in common is they were always entirely mysterious to me in the beginning. Probably a great part of the allure, discovering something that seems beyond reach, sometimes impossibly beyond reach, that pulls you forward into its orbit somehow. On the screen, he once again created the magic of details. The way he takes measurements from his muse in the frame and hems the dresses with his own hands is literally mesmerizing with its meditative truthfulness. We see a close-up of Day-Lewis's fingers, calloused from scissors and needles, pricked and scratched from pens. The hands of the real Reynolds Woodcock, who Daniel and Anderson invented as a collective image of a brilliant couturier, meticulous, bent on his business, fixated on control over everything and the stability of his life patterns. Day-Lewis consulted with the curator of fashion and textiles at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and interned for many months with Mark Happel, who headed the New York City Ballet's costume department. He watched and later began to help reconstruct theater costumes with his own hands. At the end of this internship, the actor decided that he was ready and that he needed to create a couture item from scratch. For this, he chose to recreate one of the dresses of the famous couturier Cristobal Balenciaga, whose image he and Anderson unanimously chose as the main prototype for Woodcock. This simple-looking dress, which Daniel fell in love with at first sight, was stored in the fashion designer's archive in Paris. Without access to it, he drew a sketch and, using his wife Rebecca as a living mannequin, began to try to reconstruct the model himself. It looked very simple until I had to figure out a way to make it, and then realized, my god, this is incredibly complicated. The code that I had to crack was a very particular gazette in the armpit. You couldn't tell from the photos how the gazette was designed. Mark and I each worked on our version of the gazette and, through trial and error, figured it out. In the end, Day-Lewis did repeat this model, sewing it from silk in a soft lilac shade, which in Phantom Thread would become Woodcock's signature shade. Knowing Daniel's perfectionism and the way he approaches everything he immerses himself in, it doesn't even seem surprising that the dress turned out gorgeous, and Rebecca later wore it to the world. In this film, as in no other, the director and costume director gave Day-Lewis complete carte blanche in choosing clothes for his character. So the actor not only mastered the couturier's craft, but also carefully thought through every detail of his personal wardrobe. When Anderson's friend, Oscar-winning costume designer Mark Bridges, came on board, Daniel already had a clear plan of action. Bridges later fondly recalled their joint shopping spree with Day-Lewis. The actor, for whom the upper world of London was nothing more than the atmosphere in which he grew up, discovered a lot of new things for the designer. In his interview about how the work on the costumes for the film went, Mark Bridges especially emphasized the actor's participation in this process. Daniel, as a true English gentleman because he grew up in the wealthy area of London's Kensington and was the son of a famous poet, was well-versed in this whole world of quality things that were created to order. Thanks to him, Mark learned that it's not unusual for a man of a certain status in Britain to understand fabrics, where the buttons should be located, and to take care of his wardrobe carefully. When giving costume cues for the film, the actor recalled how his grandfather dressed, so they were sure that grey flannel slacks would be appropriate with country clothes. 
He remembered that people had been wearing their costume-made country blazers at Anderson and Shepard for years. The actor was happy to share his knowledge of English clothing, and then they worked together to make sure that these items fit the film and were also photogenic. In addition to Woodcock's costumes, Daniel also helped with how the character's home should be furnished and decorated, which should lie on his bedside table. He also decided what breed the couturier's dog should be. Day-Lewis made special demands on colleagues on set, so he insisted that he and the actress Vicky Cripps, who played his muse Alma, did not interact in any way until the very moment of filming the first scene. To make their acquaintance with both Woodcock and his sister, the way she gradually entered their lives, seem as true as possible. Despite the fact that with the actress who played the character's sister, Daniel had intensive communication for months to rebuild the family relationships of their characters. Planned from the beginning as an easy journey, the film turned out to be so intense, deep, and energetically exhausting for them that neither the director nor Day-Lewis expected it. According to Day-Lewis himself, and this was also confirmed by Mark Bridges, before shooting of the picture began, the actor had no idea what he wanted to do with acting after it. Later, Daniel recounted how he and Paul laughed and joked a lot in preparation for the shooting, and as they got deeper and deeper into the process of making the film, they began to feel an overwhelming sense of sadness. It appeared out of the blue, as if they suddenly realized what they had given birth to. In his words, it was hard to live with, and still is. For the role of Reynolds Woodcock, Day-Lewis was again nominated for an Oscar. He received a Golden Globe and many more prizes and nominations. The fashion world was delighted with the picture, but Daniel himself even refused to watch the movie when it was ready to be shown. Why? I haven't figured it out, but it's settled on me and it's just there. Not wanting to see the film is connected to the decision I've made to stop working as an actor. But it's not why the sadness came to stay. That happened during the telling of the story, and I don't really know why. And here, the great Daniel Day-Lewis, the only winner of three Oscar statuettes, the best actor of all time according to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, an actor unique in his skill, bordering on loss of personality, publicly announced that he had decided to leave acting forever. He was 60. He was at the peak of success and world fame. As we know, Day-Lewis often took breaks between films before this, which became longer and longer over the years. This time, the actor made a public statement that this time, he was going to leave for good. Why did he choose to do this publicly? As he noted in one of his interviews throughout his acting career, he regularly had the desire to stop acting. Sometimes Day-Lewis even voiced it, but this time, everything was different. This time, the impulse to finally leave was so ingrained in him that it actually became an obsession, and he felt he really had to do it. Officially, he made this statement precisely in order to draw a line publicly, leaving no way back so that his curiosity or some other circumstances do not drag him into another project again. What was he going to do? What to devote life to? Rumors began to circulate here that the actor, after his experience with Phantom Thread, decided to start a career as a fashion designer. Moreover, before that, he had already mastered the skills of creating shoes as well. But in his characteristic manner at such assumptions, Daniel only smiled out of the corner of his mouth and said mysteriously, Who knows? He's a very versatile person and has many hobbies. He draws well. He had the experience of writing a comedy script together with his wife, Rebecca. He loves making furniture and carpentry. Once on the set of Rebecca's film, The Private Lives of Pippa Lee, Daniel was actively involved in the production of scenery. But it is still hard to imagine that a person who made such a significant contribution to cinema will stay away from it forever. Especially since, in the winter of 2024, the actor was seen in the company of Martin Scorsese, and later the director announced that maybe Day-Lewis would join his new film. Let us know in the comments if you think we'll see more of Daniel Gray on screen. I won't know which way to go for a while, but I'm not going to stay idle. I don't fear the stony silence. Do I feel better? Not yet. I have great sadness, and that's the right way to feel. How strange would it be if this was just a gleeful step into a brand new life? I've been interested in acting since I was 12 years old. When I began, it was a question of salvation. Now, I want to explore the world in a different way. Today, he's 66 years old, he has a wife with whom he's been together for 27 years, and has three adult sons. Gabriel Kane, his first son from Isabella Gianni, lived with his mother in France until he was a teenager. But at the age of 14, he decided that he wanted to live with his father and move to Ireland with him. He successfully involved in the modeling business and music, and even managed to release his own album. The middle son, Ronan Cal, went on his mother's steps and after obtaining a bachelor's degree in fine arts from Harvard, continued his career as a director and artist. 
The youngest, Cashel Blake, also inherited the family artistic gene, and for him, it manifested itself in an interest in music. The De Lewis family is quite friendly. Everyone supports each other. The sons are quite proud of their parents, but in fact all of them, like the children of many star parents, can confirm the words of the elder. I'm very proud of who my parents are, but they really set a bar and cast an immense shadow. It's made it hard for me to find myself. The circle closed, and Daniel's children found themselves exactly at the same point where he had once been, starting life in the shadow of the fame of his father, the most famous poet in Britain. So what awaits Day Lewis in the future, apart from the fact that he will watch the creative growth and success of his sons and arrange a quiet and comfortable life for himself and Rebecca, making cozy furniture with his own hands and taking care of the house? Maybe he'll continue to ride a dirt bike until he's 80 years old and take part in one more MotoGP, this time not as a passenger, but as a pilot? Can he start his own line of handmade shoes? Or will he open a real Irish pub and call it Three Oscars? You can expect anything from the great and unpredictable Daniel Day-Lewis. But we just don't want to believe that he'll never again amaze us with his new screen transformations. So, we will wait. Maybe we will hear about him in the world of film business. If you're interested in our story, we also have videos about other famous actors and directors, interesting facts from their personal and creative lives. So, click on the video that appeared on your screen and learn more. Thank you for watching to the end. We will be sincerely grateful for your like and we'll be happy to tell you even more interesting stories. Stay with us on the Biographer channel. See you soon.